Good evening, everyone. This is the first ever CNCNZ.com uh, live stream here on Twitch. And for our very first one, we are doing a retrospective stream for Command & Conquer 1. Uh, I am Ploki the Wolf, the lead administrator of the site, also from the CNC uh, wiki, and I am joined by the following people. Darth Jane, the uh, author of Rathed and a general extreme help in uh, CNC modding. Uh, Taxel Bear, who runs the uh, RTS-centric uh, YouTube channel, with uh, CNC being very prominently featured. And Ture, uh, from CNC Communications Center and CNCNet. Say hi, everyone. <laughs> hey, everyone. Hi. Hello. Uh, so how this will going to uh, how this is going to work is that we are going to play some Tabrian Dawn matches via CNCNet, and we are going to touch on some subjects uh, about it, uh, how it plays all these years later, uh, what has aged well, what hasn't, uh, if anything was to be changed, what what it would be, and we have a preset a set of questions for future streams uh, we might do something more open like some sort of Q's and A's or maybe have some uh, questions sent in beforehand. So for now I suggest we start this game that we have set up a four-way free-for-all and um, whenever you're ready ladies and gentlemen So, how to go there? Uh, in the lower left you'll okay. see the I'm ready button. That button hasn't been there before. It's a sneaky ready button. Yeah, it'd be sneaky. There we go. New I don't know about you guys, but I find this um, line of sight pretty small at the start. Yeah, it's kind of weird how infantry has like the tiny... Ooh, someone is very near me. Very near. Yeah, it seems... I can't really turn on the volume a bit. That's a bit unfortunate, but I'll try to figure that out next time or so. Uh, volume of what? Of the game. So I actually turned it off, but it still, it still seems to be a full volume, but I'll, I'll figure out. Yeah, that's because you've turned down the volume of the client, just probably. So, oh, doesn't that count? No, they're oh. two different applications. Okay, I'll try that again now. Give me a second here. Hmm. Oh, there we go, yeah, that's better. Yeah, that does it. Awesome. So, uh, full disclaimer, um, none of us, uh, apart from Ture, are really up to scratch with the Tiberian Dawn meta particularly. Even though we've pretty much all played it before, just not online. Yeah, don't, don't expect the latest strats to be revealed in this exciting stream here. And uh, guess who is closest to me? The person who <laughs> who knows the most about it. But yeah, I see way too many planes flying around here. Uh, let's see. We can solve that situation. Also, I seem to have a bit of a heretical. Um, color scheme. I'm gold not. Gold not, dear. Let's just say you're undercover. <laughs> really badly. Be. 
So I'm just going to. Oh dear. Shouldn't have done that. Well, on my end. Stuck, thanks. Uh, well, on my end, probably aptly. Um, I, I hear Rain in the Night, part one, so. So I'm off. Oh dear. Connection is not optimal for me, but I'll. Yeah, I'll do. Yeah. Oh, what you gonna do? Apart from sell off and uh, act like the AI in a seek and destroy kind of way. Yeah. Oh, uh, reconnecting to Texal Bear. Mm. Yes. Mm. Yeah. The power of the internet. Yeah, I'm afraid. We can do um, this. Yep, no. no. You seem to also be breaking up uh, in the voice chat. Uh, also, Ture, uh, remember one thing. Whenever you fire on a harvester, your opponent will throw everything he's got at you. Hey, we're not the AI. <laughs> hmm. I have been this training. Oh. Oh, I have an infantry guy <laughs> somewhere. Uh, oh yeah. That's um, what the lack of short game does to you. Oh yeah, I don't like where this is going. I hear gunshots, and I'm not liking what I'm hearing. <laughs> I'm seeing very scary things here. I'd actually hope that he would just destroy one another and I would just win by default, but I guess that's not going to happen. Oh, um, apparently something is glitching out uh, and I was able to see some uh, missile trails. And I'm gone. Yeah, the fog of war is a bit derpy. I'm yeah, not sure I think if... you can just walk straight into it. Is it, um... Is it because of the renderer or something else? I think it never quite worked perfectly anyway. I think you could always have situations where you, a human walks just straight into the Shroud of War and it's not revealed, or it's revealed with a delay. Uh, no, I just uh, saw a uh, the, uh, the Shroud, but in that Shroud I saw missile trails. Okay. To be honest. Okay, I'm bracing myself here. Yeah, you look pretty braced. <laughs> yeah, but uh, some lack of mobility here. Hi there, Ferret. I don't know, know the <laughs> map. What's now or never? Classic hey, don't just drive past me. Yeah. Oh, whatever. Let's see what we can do here. Oof. Yeah, I see some glitching in the shroud here as well. Yeah, and oh, there's a the river. Should have known that. Huh? Uh, also, Toro, you are Grey, and my name is also Grey, so we are effectively teamed up. So yeah, also, I you have way too much stuff, and I can't see you probably all flame tanks. Priority target. Pri oh, and well, I guess that didn't work out, did it? Uh, 
I never knew if, if it was um, better to prioritize targets or just leave it into the individual units. I'm not quite sure, because half the time the feeling the units just move around too much, whether it would be better if they just stay and shoot. Yeah, that, that's uh, where you can use the stop button. But sometimes uh, it's good, good to have units move around due to inaccuracy and stuff. Yeah, and I guess they take less damage. Uh, to be honest, most of the time I play, I tend to map wasp to a uh, wasp to to map movement. And in games where you can't really remap, I just use uh, use uh, what's it what's it, the just a little program to to remap keys. But it disables a couple of keys occasionally. Anyway. That was anticlimactic. <laughs> a little bit. Well, I'm still executing my counter strike here. You never know. Just at least squish a couple of you guys. That's way too many bikes. Well, that top position is way better than mine was. Way more space to go. Yeah, I've, I've got a nice river here. I think this not not all starting positions here were created equal. Yeah, that's probably before they had any idea of multiplayer balance in their minds. Yeah, but even even then, you still you still have to delay if you're not, and you have and you have your position on the the western edge of the map, so the plane needs longer and stuff like that. So even then, even if a perfectly symmetrical map, it's not it's not perfect. Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, come over here. I see you, bike. Come over here. At least bikes can't squish, otherwise that would be really depressing. Well, I was run over by a bike once. Well, yeah, sure. You can't, you can't be squished by a bike, but not. Because you weren't carrying a bazooka. <laughs> or were you? Well, I wasn't at that particular moment. Okay. You ne no, never leave home without your rocket launcher. And they say uh, bazooka guys are the ones uh, everyone ignores. Weren't they uncrushable in Aftermath? Nope. No. Oh, flame. No thank you. Oh, no, no, no flame guys, please. Why are those so fast? They have to, they have to carry a... Well, ask the ah, Team Fortress Pyro. Work. Ah, thought I could sneak in there with an engineer, but I guess not. No engineers allowed. <laughs> Sorry about that. engineers <laughs> allowed. Also, what are my harvesters doing? They're harvesting miles and miles away from my base. Yeah, I believe the harvester pathfinding was really, really bad in the early CNC games. Yeah, I'm kind of surprised it works at all, to be honest. Ironically, Dune 2000 had much better everything in that regard. Yeah, but it also has the carry alls, those help a lot. Yeah, definitely. I see your pack of bikes. Hell's Angels, not addition. Oh, why, why did that house that just stop? Oh, watch. You know what, whatever. Oh, okay. <laughs> you whatever. Know. I, I, don't, I don't even care. So, Lance, let's get back to base here. Oh, you're still alive. That's interesting. How did that house that survive so long? They do have some pretty hardcore armor. I do, but I don't recall them being that that resilient against bikes. Oh, they are. Well, they are not in uh, Dune Wars. In <laughs> Dune Wars, they basically take them. Yeah. Quite annoying. 
Well, not as much paper thin, but definitely less resilient. I mean, um, those early scout units like pit bulls and attack bikes are. I don't know if they were intentionally designed to uh, harass harvesters, but they all work so well. So it's it's their yeah, role. They're, they're supposed to be recon, but they're more mobile into air. So uh, I kind of have nothing left. Well, there's only one thing left to do. Because AI seek and destroy. <laughs> I should have built some more barracks yeah. here, but I guess I can still do that. The ferret here in, in the uh, chat is actually one of the uh, one of the best CNC one players right now. Oh, hi ferret. Okay, he's pro. Well, he's probably not going to be happy. Oh well, yeah, this is again definitely not how pros do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay, come get me with your bikes, I'm ready. Um, also, my harvester is going insane. Oh, yeah, I, I haven't mind? seen this outside of Siberian Wars in Case Wrath, where Harvester just clips through <laughs> a, a, a refinery. Yeah, that's a bit odd, but never mind. I actually thought you would just overrun me. There we go. There's there still is... time. <laughs> oh, flank. Oh, of course. What? I kind of forgot that flame tank existed for a second here. Well. Uh, you have the perfect okay, counter for them, you know. Technicians. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, well. It's now never. Kill at least one of them. Come on, you can do it, technicians. Kill one of them. Te tactical victory. Oh, wow. Okay, not bad. <laughs> well, time for one last infantry rush. Well, I guess we'll sell everything. Probably not so much, but I can at least try. Well, he got one offensive unit. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, one. No battles won. Hmm. 55 kills, could have been worse. And heavy vehicles can actually uh, squish um, recon bikes. Really? Yeah. Harvesters, MCVs, mammoth tanks, medium tanks. You should be Yeah, they're quite squishable. Now you've seen, seen the e, uh, AI do it, doing it to me. The pathfinding for it is a bit weird, but it, it's possible. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's not that easy. Apparently, uh, Foxvic can join us in 30 minutes. Oh, okay. Um, why are all the standard maps mm, six map, the six player maps? Well, yeah, it's one of those weird things because um, because uh, because most of the most of the classic maps are, are are six player, even though originally the game was only four player. Hmm. Enabling enabling six player was actually pretty easy according to Near Goods. Because it was basically a switch in the EXE file. So why wouldn't they allow that in the first place? Probably because the map sizes are so small. Okay, that's a fair point. Yeah, this map this map already felt really small, even with four players. You're pretty much right next yeah. to one another. Oh, so are you are you sure you're uh, selecting selecting uh, um, standard maps? Uh, yeah, I just gave up on that. Um, I want to, um, unless you have a, a preference for maps, I want to play four-player maps. 
uh, just adapted to that gameplay. Well, if you want to play some custom maps, uh, Blistering Sands is pretty good. Hmm. Uh, let me find it first. You can just do like um, a search and you'll find it. Um, oh, there it is. So when do we want to start with the FAQ? Oh, uh, this ma uh, this uh, current match, because of the first question we'll, which you'll see. Okay. Uh, if there are no objections, objections to the map, we can, we can start it. That uh, 184 ping. Yeah, uh, sorry, my mental is just a little bit unreliable at times. Yeah, I know how that feels. Especially in the evening. Uh, I'm not quite sure what, what the reason is because occasionally it's super fast, but then it just completely slumps at time. Yeah, probably some sort of uh, at your provider then. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll have to check it out. Okay, so uh, we are back in the game. So now we can start with why we are here at all. So the first question was, um, what is your favorite aspect of Tiberian Dawn's multiplayer overall? Oh, that's a difficult question. Yeah, it's genuinely a little bit quiet for me. Well, um... I would say that the game has a lot of um, variety and tactical opportunities in it. And especially how you... how most of the... Um, most, of, most units have projectile-based weapons. Meaning that you can actually dodge shots if you're fast enough. That's true, and you also avoid this awkward situation where you have 10 melee units and they all struggle to hit one enemy unit. Yeah. yeah. So I know it might not be like a net positive aspect overall, but I kind of like how the two sides are completely asymmetrical. Yeah. Also, who chose gold here? I can barely see you in the sand. <clears throat> anyway. I kind of like that. Of course, you can argue that it just makes the game more imbalanced. But I think it's also a nice aspect because it means that that you get a different experience and it avoids something like, let's say, Warcraft One did, where where you essentially had two ident almost identical factions. Yeah, War Warcraft One and Two really had identical factions except for the spells. Yeah, there's some minor differences in uh, some stats, but overall they were very similar. Well, yeah, but everyone, good. everyone in Warcraft 2 chooses orcs. Yeah, online. because they want uh, bloodlust ogres. Yeah, I think that can be a bit of an issue. Yeah, I think I generally like that. And I mean, it did have online multiplayer, which at least at the time wasn't standard at all. So there's well, that. Well, the boss version did not. Say for modern play and play through like Kali and stuff. Uh, okay, that's yeah, I believe uh, proper multiplayer was added with the Battlenet edition ninety nine. I'm talking about Command and Conquer. Oh, that. Uh... Proper online multiplayer for the original Command and Conquer was added in the Mac version first. Yeah. Oh no. Construction complete. Reinforcements What's wrong? Damn it. <laughs> Anyway, yeah, uh, how, how did that revert? I know I just stole a harvester. Just re re revenge. Oh dear. Now the revenge for the revenge comes. <laughs> um, I mean, back to the question. Um, perhaps maybe my um, most favorite thing of what little I've played of multiplayer from Tiberian Dawn is that it's not that slow-paced. 
because every everything is quite action packed once once you get uh, a critical mass of units going. That is true. Yeah, it's quite fast, and you can essentially get everything done in like five minutes, which can be good or bad depending on how how you see it. Yeah, red alert one is even faster. Core CNC experience in five minutes. Where did I hear that before? Oh, oh dear. G games between pro players in Red Alert 1 goes, take like three minutes or, or so. Oh. And this is my permanent curse, getting broke instantly. That happens. Yeah, I think overall the multiplayer is also quite accessible. I mean, you could argue that's just uh, something about the game in general, but you only have one resource, or you, I guess you have money and energy, but energy is really hard to understand. You could run a resource, you have two production facilities, and, and overall it's pretty, uh, pretty easy to understand. Yeah, F Ferret also brings up a good point. Posi positioning is actually a... Um... Quite, uh, quite important in this game. Uh, yeah, definitely with the kind of imbalanced um, maps uh, that come standard. I mean, if you, you can actually defeat a player with a bad position even if you have less units. Mm -hmm. Which is a thing that's lost in in some ways in more modern RTS games, especially StarCraft. Even though in StarCraft positioning is also very important, but that's more about concave and versus convex positions. Having more units firing at enemy units than the other team. Hey, get out of my base! Oh, I don't like that horde of medium tanks there. Uh, so, uh, how does the overall balance of the game, now that you've experienced it a bit, how does it feel through all these years? Does it favor GDI or not? Not. Yeah, not definitely. If, it, once, as a, if you'd asked me as a like, as a child, I would have definitely told you, oh, this is GDI, they've got bigger tanks. But that's obviously not how it works. The mobility of a mod is insanely strong. Yeah. How often are you really going to use something like the Mammoth Tank? Yeah, the Ma Mammoth Tank is a pretty decent defensive unit, but it's, a, it's very slow. Yeah, and I guess the regeneration doesn't really come into play most of the time because... because it's just too slow. I think it's good for, for single player, but that seems to be it for the most part. Well, and I got... Also, another cool thing about the Command & Conquer 1 is how useful infantry can be if you use them correctly. Yeah, flamethrower guys can be quite mean. And... Well, grenade grenade oh, as well. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hey, come, come on, I wanted to use this against someone else, never mind. Yeah, I think I can't defend myself against those tanks properly. That went well. Well. Mm -hmm. Oh, I almost got out one last tank. I also kind of believe that uh, Nod has more useful early game units than GDI does. Yeah, GDI only has one one artillery unit and you need the advanced communication center for it. Yeah, That's a really huge downside. And Nod has the very same artillery unit. <laughs> I, I never understood that. Nod already has the SMSM launcher. Why do they also have the... Well, I guess I'm gone now. They, why do they also have the the GDI missile launcher? That seems such, to be such a weird choice. That's true, but I mean, in the campaign, it doesn't really matter anyway, because the, the stakes are always completely stacked against you. No. 
No, you're closest to me, you're a threat. Some nice bases you guys got there. Um, so how well do you feel that the audio and video uh, parts of the game held up against the test of time? Well, obviously the uh, sound quality is bad. It's 22 kilohertz, but the actual sounds and how they're designed is pretty nice. You can hear the difference between a light tank and a, and a medium tank and a mammoth tank firing. You can hear the difference. Diff every single unit has a different queue, basically, sound queue. Building. Building. Yeah, I think the graphics have actually aged pretty well because you can upscale them to a higher resolution and they're 2D. Yeah, the gra graphics are pretty decent because they are... they aren't that detailed, basically. Yeah. And I think they also profit from being not 3D if you compare it to uh, Say Empire Earth. Yeah. Empire Earth looks hideous, and it was because it was a somewhat early 3D RTS. So um, this game here has aged way more gracefully. And even if you play this somewhat low resolution, let's say 720p, which is HD but not super HD, it actually looks fairly decent. And I think the FMVs they've aged pretty poorly, but then again, it's, it's FMVs from the mid 90s, so that's to be expected. I believe everything is um, readable enough when it comes to, when it comes to the graphics. I mean, the, everything could use a little bit of, of uh, touch up here and there, but um, everything is clear what it's supposed to be. Yeah. And yeah, and yeah, what you said, 2D sprites have always looked better than 3D models. Uh, in the early 2000s, um, FPS games had started to look good. But since RTS has had to uh, display a lot of things at the same time, uh, their 3D models were crap. I mean, just look at uh, Age of Mythology, Empire Earth, and stuff. I mean, who, who could who could not like all, all of these sounds and even especially the music? Yeah, another thing, or well, in addition to what uh, Tula said. The units all sound different, they also look very distinct. I think the only units and structures you can somewhat confuse are the power plant and the advanced power plant, because the advanced power plant is just the basic power plant with one additional cooling tower. And I think the the Humvee and the APC look a little bit similar. But apart from that, every unit looks fairly distinct. Even the infantry. Like even the flamethrower guy with the with the white Flamethrowers are fairly distinct, even though they're really small. And I think that's uh, not as common as it should be. There's, there's a fair amount of games where it's a bit difficult to distinguish units and structures properly. And But here it's actually fairly easy to identify all of them with just one glance. Yeah, it's all about the similar. Also, this mm -hmm. map is a prime example of an unbalanced map. The two remaining players currently have the most amount of numbers of crossing trees. Everyone else has uh, ability fields that have openings to ward their enemies. Yeah, that's true. So some have just have night blossom trees in their backyard that are essentially free if you want, want to see that. Also, also, if you notice, um, there is a bit of a problem here with my harvester that's locked in since the start of the game <laughs> between the refinery, a cliff, and the airstrip. It's been unusable since. Uh, how did that happen? Well, yeah, I just. Oh no, see, it's, it's behind the airfield. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Means... Oh, one uh, last rush. Yep. Another th thing about the balance is um, the. Uh, the GDI medium tank is a tiny bit overpowered, in my opinion. I guess. I guess what? 
It is such a good all-rounder unit that it can be used for basically anything, and it has very good good um, armor. But I have no clue how to, like, balance it, balancing it. Maybe make it a tiny bit more expensive, or slowing down its production time a little bit. Mm. There's also GDI. There's also there's also GDI's lack of uh, any uh, anti-air vehicle. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, Apaches are can be a bit of a curse. To be honest, this game doesn't really feel like it was made with air units in mind. Obviously, the the GDI Orca is very iconic, but it doesn't really feel like they intended for air units to to be really a core part of the game, especially because all of them have to land. So even if you have only ground units, sooner or later you can always kill all air units by just destroying the pads or destroying them on the ground. So you never have a situation you, that you could have in generals where the helicopter stays airborne all the time. And you definitely need at least one anti-air unit to bring it down. Yeah, you cannot even select uh, an air unit while it's midair. Yeah, that's true as well. Yeah, or unless you have, have a yeah, unit, unless you have unit control room. Control room. That's yeah, true. or unless you're playing open array. They, they fixed that in Red Alert. Yeah, and the air units also don't do any recon. They can fly through the shroud, but you'd think the airplane would be best at revealing the shroud, but they can't do it at all. Yeah, it's not, not really intuitive. I mean, if you added... Fog of War to the game, I, w I would think that uh, infantry should be the units with the uh, largest view distance. Because the problem with helicopters, if you think about it in real life, it, you could probably see like larger things in them, like uh, tanks and structures, but infantry is really, really hard to see in any aircraft. Hence, why, true, yeah. hence why like modern helicopters have like thermal vision and um, and how they um, differentiate between um, between friendly soldiers and enemy soldiers is that the uh, soldiers have different frequencies of IR bl uh, IR lights on them that blink otherwise there would be a lot more uh, friendly fire with like Apaches and stuff okay uh, for the rest of you, a, a new room is up. But then again, if the question is, is if you should add Fog of War to this game at all, because it was designed with Shroud only in mind. Mm. Yeah, to be honest, I'm not the biggest fan of the of Fog in this game here, because it would mean that you could use air units only if if there's a ground unit giving it vision, which could argue as a feature, but it also means that you'd have, you kind of have to change how you approach the game in that regard. You'd also have to decide whether you can use, this, let's say, the iron cannon into the, into the fog or or not, stuff like that. So yeah, I don't think you could, could just add it and that would be it. Um, well, if you would add... Uh, if you would add Fog of War, you would definitely need to raise uh, the uh, unit vision and structure vision throughout, throughout the game because this is really a pathetic radius that everything has. Yeah, save, save for like uh, home base and recon base and buggies. Yeah, I guess you could use that to make the, the use like the watchtower more useful by giving the watchtower really good clearing vision. Mm, that could be that could be something that would fix it on the defensive side, but you would still need uh, some something that would really help you see things in offense. Yeah, yeah. yeah but like I said, if you think it in realistic terms, infantry and uh, more open vehicles like the buggy and the uh, recon bike would be the ones with the um, most vision. While like armored vehicles would have the least vision, and the helicop helicopters, I'm not really sure how to do that. Yeah, I think it would be kind of interesting to have the helicopters only see structures, but that would essentially completely change how they are used. Uh, well, you cannot really implement in in this kind of game such a feature because if you would 
uh, have a helicopter uncover the shroud or fog of war around a specific structure, you would still see some pixels around the structure, so you could see some units moving around it. So it's, it will still not be a, a perfect, uh, perfect match to that description. Mm -hmm. Also, RT2 Strong reminded me of one other thing why I like this game, and that is that there's this is a game, game more of a game of soft counters rather than hard counters. There is no such thing like build rocket soldiers and you kill all the tanks. You basically have to uh, you have to uh, ma micromanage your rocket soldiers a bit and avoid the tanks and and uh, optimally include your rocket soldiers with other units. Yeah, also, it's not generals in that account. Also, uh, even like uh, bug buggies and uh, buggies and um, humvees, which many in many games would be solely an anti-infantry uh, uh, kind of deal, actually does some decent damage towards light vehicles and even light buildings. Yeah, and, and you can't crush infantry with light vehicles. So you yeah. can't just take a couple of fast buggies and just plow through infantry. You actually need to stop and take them all down. And minigunners actually have a pretty decent damage output for their prize. It's They're not yeah. fragile. It's not, like, it's, like, it's not like generals where you can like build a Humvee and kill all the red guards by just driving true, into yeah. them. And there's also nothing like this. Well, there's the commando, but the commando is a fairly high-end unit. I'm not quite sure how much the competitive multiplayer use the commando. Uh, sees. And, and I think you, even in multiplayer, you still have to manually target everything with the commando, don't you? Yeah, this is uh, in. Uh, it r rarely appears in pro games or well, uh, pro games, but uh, it sometimes does. And if you're sneaky, uh, commandos can be really devastating. But not, yeah, as, one shot, yeah. but, but not as overpowered as Tanya is in Red Alert. What because, makes Tanya better than the Commando? Because Tanya destroys a building and no infantry spawns out of it. Ah yeah, I forgot about that almost. That is somewhat frustrating in single player as well, where you have your awesome Commando and then the Commando blows up three buildings and then, then he's almost dead. Because there's just mini cannons coming out of every single one of them. Yeah, and they don't have guard mode. And at least Tanya uh, doesn't. In, as, in, as infantry is also very prevalent in pro games, the uh, commando is very u useful as, at dispatching them if you have, well, basically the actions per minute enough to do it. And the uh, an accurate enough mouse movement. Uh, this is also a thing about this game, and more, it more, it's more a factor in Red Alert, but you have to be accur accurate with a mouse if you want to beat a good player. In some sense, it's like uh, one of the requirements of a um, FPS game. Simply because uh, this game and Red Alert does not have fancy stuff like attack move and stuff. Even though you can so you can sort of emulate attack move by like. Once, once your units approach the others, you press the S key to stop them, and they will target whatever um, unit. Also, when it comes to battles, it's really, in this game and Red Alert, important to target the units with the least HP, or if you don't know what units have the least HP, target a stationary unit, because then they receive the, the full damage. Um, also, another another cool thing, when units are, when vehicles are damaged, you can see it by the smoke smoke trail they have. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's... they they do slow down, so you actually have a you don't have the like the feature where you, a unit with a single hit point left is still as powerful as as the one that is at full health. Yeah, that's that's definitely one of the better points, better design points in the series in general. Uh, also, when when we're while we're on the subject of things like attack move and 
modern concept in general, uh, what improvements could be made to the user interface in order to make the game feel more modern and accessible in the present day? So to start, I would, as much as I harp against uh, OpenRA, I really think that everything that they did for the interface, from the interface point of view, has been positive, like um, queuing units, uh, those tabs that have debuted in Riddler 2. I yeah. actually in Riddler 1 for a PlayStation Asterix. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Good point, good point. Yeah, uh, I like, yeah, queuing would be nice. I'm not too sure about queuing, but I, I see why people want, want it. Well, actually, uh, while he was still active on Discord, um, Joe Bostic said that he could have tr very trivially done the queuing mechanic if he had remembered or got an idea to even do it. He, he simply didn't think of it at the time. Yeah, yeah. I think it's partially uh, partially compensated for by the fact that you have the, the build bar on your right hand side at all times. So it's not like an Age of Empires situation where you can't queue, but you also have to select every single one of your barracks or stables separately to build, which is just really frustrating. Well, true, but in Age of Empires you can you can still queue something up and forget about it. While here uh, you can only build one mini gunner, then forget about it, uh, and because you are concentrating on something else in the game. And uh, when you come back to the base, oh, I just have one mini gunner, and I was planning to make an entire army. What to do now? Even okay, in that's, that's... even in StarCraft, pro players don't usually use the queuing mechanic in the game. Really? How come? They they select the barracks, then they queue one unit. Simply because in StarCraft, your credits or resources are deducted for every unit you queue. Well, yeah, but you oh, can yeah, still. But yeah. you can still uh, anticipate approximately how much money you can uh, invest in this attack wave. Sure, but uh, you lose money that could be used for something else, like building a new command center or something. Well, it all comes down to what, what your current priority is. Yeah, but, but having more more resources available at all times is better than having them stored in some queue in some random barracks someplace. To quote Greg Kasavin, if you hear silos needed, you're not building enough units. Yeah, that's the deal. Yeah. The silos have I think the only purpose of the silos is that you can save money in single player. Because if you yeah if you hear silos needed then you're just not building enough stuff. I'm not satisfied with that tank wall over there. That's okay. Yeah, but I think that the silos, they add a lot of atmosphere because T Tiberium is so central to the storyline that they kind of need for the feel, I think. Ah, uh, good old tank dancing, pathfinding overpowered. Also, what other uh, mechanics or concepts from modern RTSs and modern games, do you think would fit well? Uh, I really, I really like the g general's way of handling super weapons and support powers. Having them on the uh, le uh, uh, left side of the screen in little box. That is nice. Yes. Yeah, definitely. It's really helpful. Jane, what do you think of all of this? Um, I'm the same side. I love general's abilities. Construction complete. Are there any concepts that you, that you would add apart from that in CNC? Either a future game or this one because we are getting a remaster soon? I'm not quite sure, but I think in any case, I think what I would like to see is that a remaster has a, a legacy mode. That is just. That is just uh, the the game as it was, even even with all the broken aspects. And um, on that subject, uh, if the gameplay, the, the the very core of the gameplay would be changed uh, in Command and Conquer and Red Alert One, uh, 
you know, we're not currently playing real one. Uh, how much do you think it should be changed? Uh, in what aspects? Not a lot. <laughs> yeah, I think some rebalancing might be fine. For example, not doesn't need the uh, doesn't need three artillery units. But overall, to once I think it would be difficult to balance it perfectly, and I'm not quite sure whether that's needed. Uh, hey, what, what do you think they're doing there? <laughs> Testing out the firepower of the Apaches. Um, to be quite honest, I would be completely against any adding or removing existing units from the game. I mean, we have witnessed this recently with StarCraft 2 as a version 4.0, where a lot of units have been either removed or have been completely repurposed. Okay. And I believe that that completely destroys the flair of of the game and. You end up with a lot of useless assets that you used to have available to you. I mean, and it distracts from the original vision of the game. Oh, I think I made someone angry. Also, I don't like that huge, like, pseudo-Soviet tank force just lurking around there. Pseudo-Soviet. Well, it's red, and it's, and it's, uh, lots of tanks. Da, comrade. Mm -hmm. I mean, da, tovarish. Oh, great, self tanks. Oh, great. No cash. But yeah, no. No, 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 not the lag, please. Well, can target uh, your air force building. That's great. Well, yeah, that's that's a real problem with this game. The the inability to target air units yeah. or select them when, guess, when they're mid fight. You have to hang around there and hope that that they. Uh, yeah, that's way, way too far. get targeted. I mean, your stuff is uh, even too fast for the same size to kill them. Ooh, mm -hmm. now that's a serious accusation. Also, I just got access to the S. Do you have to build an obelisk to get access to the SM launcher? Yep. That's ridiculous. Also, what's my half? Oh, never mind. <laughs> Don't care. Mm -hmm. I really need to change my oh, faction color next match. Oh no, harvesters, please. Yes, yes, my patches are doing something, but I can't see because the shroud is in the way. Mm -hmm. I'm getting screwed yeah, hard here. Going back to the questions, I think if they change anything. There should definitely be a legacy mode that, that just leaves everything unchanged. That should definitely be a thing. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we are here to celebrate what used to be a really influential game. And it belonged in a specific time period. And it's influential for the reasons that it is. So why change well, something that's already was... accepted as it is? Anyway, looks like T got their revenge there. I can't really see what's going on on the other half of the map because I don't have don't have enough recon to see. But let's 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 find out. Oh dear. Also, I keep forgetting about some units in the Tiberium because they are not that easy to spot. But apparently, you, they do not take much damage if they're just standing on the Tiberium, only if they're moving from it. 
Yeah, it's movement that damages you. Standing doesn't damage you at all. Yeah. From what I recall. Yeah, I mean, I, I, keep, I keep forgetting that. Mm -hmm. So, I'm toast. For first time that I'm done first. Infantry rush, yeah. Yeah, I know where, where, where both those napalm launchers. Oh dear, oh dear. The red wave is coming. Also, um, what I always noticed about um, Command & Conquer, because it is a 1995 game, it was basically made in a time when everything, you know, military base was cool. So, how do you, uh, how well do you think uh, Command & Conquer 1 uh, brings that feeling of commanding this army into battle? It kind of feels like you're commanding toy soldiers, and I kind of like it. Yeah, what I like is that most of the units are realistic in the sense that they're just uh, mostly US military units, like the Apache and whatnot, but you also have these slightly futuristic units like the Orca. The Orca is, is a sci-fi unit, but it's not completely out there. It's not like a teleporting tank or so. So it's somewhat grounded. Of yeah, course, the Orcas of Light also isn't really realistic. But yeah, that's, it, that, that's the most out outlandish thing in the game. Yeah, but... It, yeah, but it's, Say for the Tiberian. So, I mean, at least do it. And so it's not... Um, you're breaking up, Tax. Yeah, I just noticed. Sorry for that. Uh, so you were saying? But what I just want to say is that, yeah, as far as that, so the Obelisk is probably the most outlandish unit there, but even that feels at least moderately realistic, so it gives us a nice feeling of being uh, taking place in the, the near future without being really a, sci a full sci-fi game. Well, we still have R&Ds in military, so... I guess, I guess what you're saying is right, but um, touching on that, uh, how uh, much do you think realism is good for any any game at all, especially Command and Conquer? Uh, how much uh, should a game be realistic, and how much should it detract from that to be an enjoyable game to play? Because everyone yeah, seems seems to, I believe. Um, glorify realism and want to mod everything to be realistic, but how much do you think that holds true? The, the game should be realistic enough that a person can suspend uh, their disbelief, basically. So it shouldn't be too outlandish. Uh, it, it should be, like, uh, internally consistent, is what I mean. Yeah, I think it's alright if everything seems plausible, not necessarily realistic. So a, a plausible would say that uh, a bazooka is good against vehicles, and the artillery unit outranges the tank. So that is sufficient. Obviously, like, all the units in the game have a range that's way too, way too slow to be able uh, well, way too too low to be realistic, but that doesn't really matter. I think it's just uh, it's a relative thing. As long as the artillery outrages the tank, that's fine because that's what you would expect. And as long as, let's say, the fire weapons are good against infantry, that's also what you would expect. So as long as we are keeping it uh, plausible within the game, I think we're good. Also, realism can have the effect of uh, making the game more um, accessible. Because because, just like uh, Tax said, also, if units are grounded enough, like, this is a tank, this is a bigger tank, the bigger tank will obviously destroy the, lo the smaller tank. But the smaller tank has better speed or whatever. Uh, 
Yeah, I think that's fair. And that's also one advantage that this game has over uh, pure sci-fi games. Yeah. But because uh, you can also... Yeah, if you do have to something like a drone that shoots blue plasma, what does that mean? Is it good against infantry? Is it good against buildings? And it doesn't mean that it isn't fine, but it makes it, as you just said, uh, less accessible because obviously everybody expects the big tank to be uh, far more powerful than the, than the medium tank and that immediately gives everyone a cue of what they have and what, what the unit does. You, you can also take realism too far in the, what shall I say, super realistic uh, direction. In, where, for, for example, war game where um, you have what's the difference between a T T seventy two BM and a T seventy two BU? What's the most powerful tank? Unless you're really into tanks, you're not gonna know that. Yeah, the T T seventy two BU is actually the code name for a T ninety. But uh, well, there you go. Uh, but uh, but uh, you need to in war game you need to be kind of into like military militaries and how they're built up and stuff because that that unit uh, or I mean that game has if you go into the armory and you check out how many units the game has it has one thousand five hundred units. That's a lot of units. The, the so Soviet tank section is several pages of different tanks. Mm -hmm. like, Just, it, uh, when, I was, when I was younger, I would have told you more units are better, because more is always better. But I think that if you do that, you always risk of running into a situation where units just replace one another. So you have six medium tanks, and tank A just replaced tank B, who replaces tank C, who replaces tank D. So you may as well just have tank A. I mean, it works in games like uh, Empire Earth and the Age of Empires, but here, where there is no age system, uh, that's yeah, true. It, it wouldn't um, really work. That's a good point. In Age of Empires, you have units that are specifically designed to be replaced, because you have this aging mechanic. Yeah, that's a good point. But I guess in Command Conquer, you don't really have that. You do have teching. You have the tech center or the communication center, but it doesn't really allow you to upgrade all your stuff. It just unlocks a couple of units. But the, I think the, the amount of units is large enough to have variety, but it's small enough to not make all of them redundant. And give in, essentially in, let's say, 20 minutes to half an hour, you can get an overview over all the units and what they do. It doesn't mean it doesn't make you an expert at the game, but you can get a pretty good idea of what you have. Um, games like uh, Journals and Tiberian Wars had uh, descriptions for each unit, what it was good for and what it was uh, bad against for. Um, what, do you think that it would help in CNC 1, Brother 1? Sure, why not? But the problem about these, those things are that, is that they got to be, they need to be updated according to the meta. Yeah, sure. Which, which will be a very time-consuming thing for, for the developers to do. I mean, like, even the descriptions in StarCraft Two are outdated. Well, at some point, a, a game will exit support. I mean, uh, apart from CNC Rivals... Uh, sorry, CNC Tib Tiberium Alliances, uh, every CNC game had, like, a year's worth of support. Uh, with very few exceptions like Zero Hour getting patches two years after it was re released and it only got two. Um, so I believe that um, when they decide to make a final patch that they update it, they, they really uh, make an effort to keep every single string updated and after that uh, just see if they can make any ad additional ones later on. The issue is, how do they know it's for final update? I mean, for Tiberium Wars, uh, 1.10 was planned, but it never saw the light of day. That's true, that's a good point, but uh, every time you still know uh, how many people in your team are assigned to what, and how many you can, uh, you can transfer 
into something else just, uh, just to make a patch in a week or two. Because in, in that particular instance, uh, Tiberium Wars 1.10 was planned when Case Wrath was already out, I believe, and Red Alert 3 was heavily in production, if not out. I have to check the date later when uh, when it was supposed to be released. And uh, I believe Kings Wrath 1.03 was mentioned to be in production. No change log was ever released, uh, unlike for one, Tiberium Wars 1.10. But, you know, Red Lord 3 came out, uh, Red Lord 3 Uprising was being made, and all that CNC Arena kerfuffle. I think, thinking, thinking a bit about uh, how long a game was supported, I think, of all the Command and Conquer games, I think Red Alert 1 was the game that was support, supported the longest. It only, it only had uh, public patches until 1997. Uh, and if we count the uh, 3.0x beta stage, I, I don't know if we can really count that because that was supposed to be semi-secret and it was never publicly announced and we, if I believe, got those files thanks to some people who were sneaky enough to uh, save the files and distribute them later. Yeah, I'm I think, not I sure think that qualifies. They were they were actually published though. Well, yeah, but how many people were aware of of uh, those links? How many people were actively searching through Westwood's FTP? I don't know, but uh, the game game was actually being patched and supported. That was the point, even though it was never released. Sadly. Mm, I guess that's fair. So did. Did Aftermath actually introduce patches as well? Because um, Counter Strike didn't really like add any new units or anything. So did yeah, but Aftermath... there was an official patch 1.7 that brought Red Alert One to the internal version of Counter Strike, so people could still be compatible with each other. Oh, okay. Yeah. And uh, I believe the same was true for yeah, uh, the same was true for patch 2.00 which was the intro version of uh, Aftermath. Okay. Uh, all of these patches you can see on CNC.com. Um, this uh, 2.00 2. Is, uh, it is Aftermath, but it is compatible with version 1.08, which is the, well, the, the last official patch released. Unless you count changing the uh, version number to 2. 2.00 as a patch. Uh, did you investigate uh, exactly if anything was changed between the two? Because um, they would. You... In the 2.00 mode or aftermath, you have changes like the new units and the um, production speed decrease. Well, yes, but only if you're playing aftermath as it is. Yeah. But is there anything if you if you were just if you just had vanilla Red Alert one and patched it to two point zero zero without installing aftermath, what would happen? Uh, there's no difference basically. So would it be like aftermath, but without the new units? Uh, no. That would be an entirely different meta, and they would break a lot than they uh, more than they would fix with that. Yeah. Did, did Aftermath have the uncrushable bazooka troopers, or did I just imagine that? Yeah, uh, that's a Yuri's uh, Revenge unit, the Guardians. Gar Guardian Guardian GI, yeah, and only when they're okay, deployed. Yeah. Uh, then there's probably some, some sort of model we're thinking of. Visual web Apple maps that had uncrushable bazooka troopers. Yeah, well, consi yeah considering, the, considering the number of mods you've played, I, I'm, I'm not uh, sure I can blame you. Well, they, yeah. they all blend together, really. The only un aftermath unit that is an infantry unit that is uncrushable is the uh, shock trooper. Oh well, yeah, I found that quite interesting because it's the shock trooper was well, essentially as expensive as a tank, but it's it, it's almost like a vehicle except it has infantry health and armor. It didn't really make any sense, but whatever. Uh, also. I'd like to ask you guys uh, something that I've noticed, uh, especially when, when talking to people who are not really into strategies in RTS. 
uh, there will be always a problem of uh, people who would like to tr try an RTS out and then quit because they couldn't get uh, the hang of it. Uh, how much do you believe RTSs and in this case CNC and Red Alert uh, bring the message on how to play the game? I'm not just talking about tutorials because I don't believe they even have tutorials apart from anything that you could read in the manual. Uh, how much do they bring the message? Yeah, you're supposed to be doing this. You're supposed to be attacking and not focusing on defense. You're supposed to be harvesting as much Tiberium as you, as you can and be fast, it's kill or be killed, and that sort of thing. To be honest, I don't think it's conveyed all that well, primarily because the campaign seems to be most people's access part of the game. I don't really know many people who would only play multiplayer but not the campaign. And the campaign works completely differently. The campaign generally encourages you to be as defensive as possible, uh, to be very conservative, and to more rely on the knowledge you have gained about the map or the mission, as opposed to just doing recon all the time. Of course, not everybody approaches a game like this, and most people will be aware that there's a difference between how the campaign is structured and how multiplayer works, but I don't really think the game conveys it as well as it could. Yeah, it, it like um, basically all RTS games convey it very poorly. I mean, even StarCraft Two does that really poorly if you consider the uh, campaign as a some sort of starting point or introduction to the multiplayer. Because in StarCraft Two, the gameplay of the um, campaign is radically different from the multiplayer multiplayer you have like di different you have different units you have different basically different factions in my opinion uh, the group was handled it quite well because um controversial opinion <laughs> <laughs> i mean um you get a lot from your first uh Tiberium field but you, uh, the maps aren't as uh, close. Uh, the enemies aren't as close as you cannot expand. So you usually are able to um, do what you do in multiplayer: build a few harvesters, expand, and then build up an army, which is quite nice. I mean, I remember playing. Um, on and the other games and not being a being able to expand because if I would uh, I would immediately be crushed. Yeah, you you need to like in many strategy games you need to uh, in order to expand you need to basically get some map control first and then you can expand. One one of the weird things about the classic Command and Conquer games is that you you don't expand like in StarCraft where you like set up a new base. You expand by literally making your base longer. In some some sense, it's, I would say Age of Empires does the same thing. You expand by like literally really making your town bigger and bigger and bigger instead of making small outposts everywhere. Yeah, Command Conquer, at least the Tiberian Dawn, doesn't really give you the option of building an expansion point or taking over tech building. I think, from what I, so my feeling is that I, that the developer thought about more you just using your harvesters further away from your base. You can take over enemy bases and build there, but it doesn't really feel like, like a basic thing you should do. Whereas in, in StarCraft, just building your expansion or in Age of Empires, building your, your uh, what's it called? Your storage bit and everything, that's quite easy to do, but you can't really do that in, in this game here. But the maps, as, as Jane said, are really small anyways, for the most part. There's barely any space for expansion anyway. Yeah, uh, the original Command and Conquer and uh, Red Alert 1, the uh, one of the side effects of how bases are built is that in, that 
is that in order to expand you need to build these snake bases all over the map. Yeah, or you need to do something like building sandbags, but that doesn't really feel like it was intended to be to be done that way. That feels like a little bit of an exploit. Yeah, it's more more actually more useful in making like uh, power plants and uh, barracks and. Yeah, I guess it's faster and they're fairly cheap. And, and you probably want more power and more barracks anyway. Yeah, until you reach a Tiberium um, Tiberium patch, and then you build your refineries close to that. Yeah. Also, alternatively, you can make a ton of refineries, like, sort of centrally, close to a lot of Tiberium patches, and hope your and manage your harvesters really well. Actually, in a pro games in Tiberian Dawn, it is a must to manage your harvesters because they will usually go off and do something stupid like, oh, there's a tiny bit of Tiberium in, in the other, uh, other side of the map behind the enemy base. Let's go there. Yeah, or all three harvesters try to harvest the same patch of Tiberium and then just spend the next fi five minutes trying to run over one another. Uh, uh, and another thing I, uh, I, I actually almost forgot is that uh, if there's one thing I would have like added to Tiberian Dawn aside from the UI aspect, it's um, building multiple wall segments. Oh yeah, time. yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, I think but... uh, I think Tiberian Sun was the first one to introduce that, right? Yeah, yeah. Tiberian Sun had the longer walls. And later on, I think Red Alert 2 had the walls that would be dynamic, so you could just place them next to a wall you already have, and it would yeah. automatically extend it. That was uh, added in a patch in Tiberian Sun. Really? Okay, well, I stand corrected. Yeah. Ver version 113, I think? Okay, I forgot about that. I just yeah. remember it having the gates and the just longer wall segments. Yeah, it didn't really have any longer wall segments. Really? Was so I just imagining that? Just... Yeah, the, actually, the first f first uh, wall you could actually build multiple uh, segments in some sense at, at a time as the uh, laser fences, even but in the true. original version. Yeah, you, then... could make, you could make ridiculous laser fences, but just by just building two two of the poles in one line, but far away from another, and you would just get a huge laser fence. Yeah, and in version one. I think it was one one three. You get uh, the ability to, like, build five wall segments at a time, or ten if you do it uh, sneakily. But uh, then they uh, up the price of walls from like fifty uh, to one two hundred and fifty. Also, speaking of building wall multiple wall segments at a time, I think actually Emperor Battleford Dune did it uh, kind of interestingly. You you place down like a, uh, a the uh, foundation for like um, a bunch of for for a wall, and then it will uh, build the wall one piece at a time and automatically place them. Instead of having all the walls just appearing. Oh yeah, it's essentially going. To, it essentially builds them manually, but it does it for you. Yeah. But it does it how you would build a wall in CNC one. Yeah. One thing I want to ask you two guys. One thing I always found a little bit odd about Taberadon is that there's a couple of unit structures that don't really appear in the campaign, like the chainlink fence, the SSM launcher, or the the uh, Tiberium Trooper, which only appears in in the uh, Court Operations missions, even though in the campaign the odds are stacked against you anyway. So it doesn't really matter whether you have, or the whether you or the AI have overpowered units, because the AI is always overpowered anyway. So I always found that kind of odd. Do you think uh, there should be an option to make those accessible in the campaign? Uh, if there was uh, a difference in the metas, like you would you suggested, between the default mode and legacy mode, let's just call them that. Uh, if there is some sort of default mode, I would 
uh, actually before that, if it was done correctly and with um, the map difficulty in mind. Uh, because what happens when you uh, change the meta without considering uh, the actual difficulty of the missions is what infamously happened with Tiberium Wars. It was uh, you would really have to uh, intensively test each mission that you make a change f change to, and it, even even if you just do a simple uh, value change of the damage of a minigunner. Uh, yeah, that's so it really like needs to be carefully action. carefully done because those units are already in the game and you would effectively make them available for for that mission that I can accept but it has to be done properly and properly tested that uh, the average player who does not uh, necessarily have 1000 hours clocked on this game can uh, can still finish the mission with the resources that he has uh, been given at any one moment. Yes, that's true. Because the the like the Apache, not now as the Apache doing the campaign, even though the Apache as an air unit would be a huge game changer, especially because GDI has pretty weak anti air altogether. Yes. Yeah, speaking of the multiplayer only units, one of my favorite cheats on the Sega Saturn version. Oh, for Command and Conquer is the cheat that uh, unlocks pretty much every unit. You mean the fun part campaign? Uh, no, the Sega Saturn has a um, oh, okay. has a um, cheat that unlocks uh, all the units for one side. So basically, you can play the campaign with. And use like uh, chemical warriors and commandos and uh, SSM launchers. That's going to completely break some missions. Yeah, it, it totally it does. does. It breaks breaks every unit, every every mission. But the code is pretty fun. Interestingly, if you play as GDI, it also unlocks SSMs for GDI. <laughs> also, also if you play. Uh, uh, see original command and conquer, and you uh, enable a unit count. GDI sometimes spawn with SSM launchers. Gene, what do you think uh, about this subject? You are uh, a bit uh, quiet tonight. Sorry, I was half away because we have some troubles here in the house. Oh, um. Okay. Well, um, consider, considering uh, difficulty, uh, newcomers often think that RTS is kind of hard to get into. Uh, I I suppose that if you're not already raised with RTS uh, as a child, like we we all were. Uh, you apparently have some difficulties get, getting into the mechanics. So, uh, what do you guys think? What do you guys think would help this uh, this game and the genre uh, in general to bring newcomers without uh, losing the feel of an RTS and without um, alienating people who already are pretty much pretty hardcore about RTS. In my good. opinion, it's also all about a good tutorial. Because yeah. um, people need to learn that they need to build uh, the harvesters or workers in the craft series. And that's basically two thirds of the game or something. Because um, Usually, uh, newer players just lose because they don't have enough economy, and because they don't have enough economy, they have less units, and then they just trash. Well, uh, a lot of RTS games, uh, well, released after CNC ninety five, uh, have tutorials. Uh, yeah, a lot of them, a lot of them tell the players that 
he needs to constantly uh, produce uh, workers or harvesters or at least um, produce a certain amount of them. Usually it goes like, here, have a harvester, they can harvest Tiberium, and that's it. So mm -hmm. you need to, uh, you need to uh, convey to a player that um, for a stable economy you need at least five harvesters or something. I think part of the issue here is that Occasionally, the developers don't even know what the optimum strategy is for multiplayer. Because I guess most developers will play their own game in multiplayer, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they explore like what the best way to play the game is. So there might even be a case of the makers not knowing what they should actually teach you. Yeah, that's true. I, I think yeah. actually the best best way of easing players into the game is is having a tutorial but don't mark it as a tutorial basically ma make the campaign a tutorial but design it in some way that the player doesn't even know that they're being taught how to play the game I mean, yeah that's in my opinion really important I mean, yeah, kind of like uh, Stronghold uh, introduced uh, me new mechanics with each mission and you had an option to click on a uh, book icon to see what it's all about. Yeah, kind of. Even like SimCity and it's... Uh, SimCity... At least SimCity 4 has that interesting advisor system which is... Well, which was an interesting idea, but... It sort of teaches you things, but... Most of the time, it's also really annoying. Also, also the Total War series has this advisor, but in Total War, the advisor thing is totally stupid. Well, uh, advisors also exist in the Civilization series, but th those are uh, turn-based uh, games. Well, uh, Total War has a real-time mode, but only you only see uh, advisors in uh, the turn-based mode, if I recall correctly. So I'm not sure uh, how that would be useful in a genre where in every second everything can go wrong. Uh, it's, uh, in every second you, you, could, you could be calm in one second and in the next second you could have 500 mammoth tanks rolling uh, on, your, um, on your base. Yeah, I think it's also difficult for the game to know what's going on. Because in a turn-based game you can always have your advice say, oh, you're low on money. You should build more gold mines, but with an RTS game, it's really difficult for the AI to judge what's actually going on, and also to coach. Uh, hello. Um, the first guild was, for example, had a great tutorial inside their uh, campaign. It was a mission where you. Um, Basically, played uh, multiplayer maps against bots, but uh, you didn't know because it was um, really baked into the story. Like, uh, you have to accomplish uh, this trial to ascend and something. And um, the thing here is that. Um, oh, hi there, Benji. Because of uh, that way, you never knew it was actually a tutorial that just teach you how to play a multiplayer game mode. Mm -hmm. So, um, we've been going for uh, about an hour and a half now. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of us have a uh, uh, things things to do uh, later. Is there are there any thoughts right now off the hand um, that you would like to bring out about uh, Tiberian Dawn, about RTS in general, uh, the mechanics and the accessibility, anything? Yeah, uh, Banshee is in the game, by the way. Oh, we can. Uh... Play, uh, play some, uh, uh, play something uh, with him later on. Okay. But so I think I'll, um, I'll log out soon. 
just yeah. uh, one last thing I want to say is that even though I think the remasters are for a good part for the old fans, especially the ones that were dissatisfied with like, certain recent decisions made by EA. Uh, I think, nevertheless, the things would be a good opportunity to attract new players by introducing them to to like the start of the Command & Conquer franchise, but giving them the chance of doing it in a more comfortable way so they don't have to like, play on like maps that are really small, necessarily, or they have graphics that allows them to like, scale it up nice to the monitor, etc., etc. It's a chance for both, both for the, the old fans to like relive their childhood, but in like 4K or whatever, but also new players to to join the flock. And I think it would also be important uh, for the multiplayer aspect to uh, maybe have some sort of way that you can have more new players play against one another. So you don't just have situations where a veteran who has been playing the game for 20 years just start uh, all the newcomers right because um, that's a decision that makes unfun who is new who would more probably trouble uh, you're breaking up season. so could you re repeat your point hello what i just want to say is that um i think it would be important to would be important to have some sort of way to have like more newcomers uh, play against one another. So you don't just end up with uh, matches where veterans of 20 years just roll over people who started playing the game last week. Well, uh, a lot of newcomers still play among each other in existing Command and Conquer games. Um... Yeah, pretty much the only way to solve that is having some sort of ladder system. Yeah, I guess some sort of league, yeah. Well, that's not really perfect because players tend to smurf online. So uh, you can, uh, if someone is level 1, he, he can be a total newcomer who's never touched multiplayer before, but he can also be a total pro who just felt like making a new account. That's true. Sure, sure but it's the best system we have currently. Anyway, I'm going to log out, but uh, thanks for the conversation. Thank you for showing up. Yeah. Yeah, I would say I'll beat you next time, Toho, but I'm probably not going to beat you next time. <laughs> but I'll, I'll try. So <laughs> enjoy the evening and I'll see you around. Okay. Yeah, see you. Take care and goodbye. Take care. Uh, well, um, if uh, the two of you also want to share any remaining thoughts, uh, you, you can do so now, or otherwise we can uh, save it for any future streams. Uh, if not, uh, this uh, would actually be us wrapping up. Uh, thank you for joining this uh, first stream of ours, of the rest perspective of Command and Conquer 1, uh, and touching on uh, RTS in general. We would uh, be inclined to do this uh, more f frequently as our personal time schedules would allow and um, yeah uh, I hope this was uh, in any way uh, useful to the, the people who, who watched home uh, my name is Plucky the Wolf I was joined by Darth Jane uh, Tax Albert, who just uh, who went offline, and Ture. And uh, the next time, we may or may not be in a different roster, because we have a lot of CNC community leaders who we would like to hear thoughts from. So, um, until next time, uh, peace through power. <laughs>